Hi, everyone. My name is Yan Fei, or you may call me Sophie. I'm currently a postgraduate student in Buddhist studies at SOAS University of London. I feel very much privileged to have this chance to present at this great international conference. Mm. Today, I will talk about the English translations of the Platinum Sutra based on Donghua manuscript versions from the theoretical lens of thick translation. The Platform Sutra is certainly a fundamental text in the Chan literature. It relates story and teaching of Hui Nong, who was an illiterate man of humble origin, yet revered as a sixth patriarch of Chan Buddhism. Before we delve into the translation of the Sutra, I feel it's necessary to discuss a little bit about its textual history and the reason why I chose Donghua manuscript versions as my source text. The existing editions of the Platform Sutra can be grouped into two categories, namely the shorter editions in one fascicle without subdivisions and the longer edition in two fascicles and 11 chapters. Under the first category are the Platform Sutra manuscripts from Dong Hong, mainly including manuscript uh, staying F5475 um, from the British Library here after referred to as a state manuscript, and the manuscript Dongbo 77 preserved at Donghan City Museum. In the second group are the conjectured Huixing, Qisong uh, edition, Deyi edition, and Zongbao edition. In terms of the textual history of this sutra, there have been a lot of scholarly debates among issues of concern, whether the Donghan manuscript versions were the earliest and whether there existed a so-called earth text that all the other versions originated from are two most central questions. And scholars like Yang Zongwen, Yang Paski, and Shluita have made lots of discussions on this issue. For the sake of convenience, I have prepared some diagrams to illustrate the major theories on the textual history of this text. For instance, According to Schuller's reconstruction of the genealogy of the Platinum Sutra, there might exist an early Platinum Sutra version uh, from which we had two sub-lineages, the shorter edition of the Donghua manuscripts, which could be traced back to around 9th century, and the longer edition, including Hui Xing and Qi Song version, etc. While we cannot reach any sound conclusion on the genealogy issue, some common ground can still be established. While the Donghua version may not be the original version, uh, it represents a copy of an earlier version. Though different copies of the Sutra were probably in circulation as early as uh, the eighth century, the Donghua manuscripts are the early versions that are still available today. Thus, it's justified to say that the Donghua edition is the earliest surviving version. In other words, it's very likely closer to the original with less extraneous elements, which could thus enhance our understanding of the early development of Chinese Chan Buddhism. The discovery of the Donghua manuscripts of the Sutra has not only given rise to excitement in the Buddhist world, but also suggested further avenues for literary research. In the current literature, the English translations and relevant studies mainly follow the Zongbao edition, a version dating back to the late 13th century. While the Donghua manuscript versions played such an essential role in the Buddhist world, no literary scholar ever studied these versions and their transmissions to the Western world. Further, a majority of previous research adopt a linguistic perspective, such as analyzing the use of personal pronouns and the image of Hui Nong thus represented in each translation, Though such linguistic tools as systematic functional linguistics could provide a robust interpretive framework for the relations between language and its social functions, I would argue that a mere linguistic approach is not adequate for such classical Buddhist texts as the Platinum Sutra. Based on these considerations, I select two copies of the Donghang Platinum Sutra, the study manuscript and Dongbo 77 as source texts. The two copies belong to the same stamp with roughly the same length of 12,000 characters, although Dongbo 77 is better preserved than the former. Then when T.C. Chen or Chen Rongjie's translation in 1963, failing in Pasquet's translation in 1967, and Red Point's version in 2006 are chosen as target texts. 
Yampaski and Chen's translation are based on the same manuscript, and the Red Pen's version is based on Dongbo 77 manuscript. Other three translations are characterized by a voluminous body of introductions, footnotes, and commentaries, with their actual translated text constituting only a small part of the whole. For instance, Yampaski's version has 120 pages of introduction and five and 50 pages of glossary and bibliography. These translations in the word of Apia can be termed as thick translation, which aims to locate the text in a rich culture and linguistic context through annotation and glosses. Joining upon insights from previous insights, um, my research mainly focuses on the following two research questions. First, what thick translations manoeuvres are employed by three translators? Then, what images or dimensions of Chan are represented in each translation? Of course, we cannot compare every aspect of these translations. So I prepare, um, I plan to do the comparison from the lens of thick translation. Translation scholars, including Kyo Hermans, Master Chang, and Wolf, have made lots of discussions on this theoretical construct. Drawing on their insights, I have prepared this diagram again. Put it simply, I will mainly focus on the extra textual maneuvers, including translator's preface, introduction, and notes. As for the textual maneuvers, I will discuss their treatment of key Buddhist terms along with the layout of translations. First, preface or introduction. Preface can be very important. As Jeanette comments, the chief function of preface is to get the book read properly. In the prefatory materials of three translations, we could spot some central narratives going. The first basic question is what Chen is and how it is narratively constructed. In Wen T.C. Chen's introduction, Chen is embedded in the Chinese culture triad of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. For instance, he emphasizes the strong influence of Chen on the development of new Confucianism, particularly the idealist school find by Wang Yangming. He also suggests that there was a cross fertilization of Buddhists and Taoist thought, especially through Hui Yuan and others who were well versed in Taoism. Another feature of which on Wen Tixin Chan's interpretation is his endorsement of Suzuki then. He first expressed his gratitude to Suzuki in translator's acknowledgments, and then quoted his words to promote a direct, immediate, and simple approach to realization, which does not necessarily need any conscious, calculated effort like sitting meditation. Perhaps given Suzuki's pioneering accomplishments in bringing the Japanese Zen to America since the 1920s. The translator adopted the term Zen instead of Chan to label different Chan Zen traditions throughout his introduction. However, it remains very questionable to imply that Chan, here I use the legacy Chan to, um, uh, to mean a tradition where there is no Chan at all. For instance, in the Platinum Sutra itself, there is idea of the inseparability of meditation and wisdom, or in Chinese, we call it Ding Hui Yi Ti, which suggests that meditation is a necessary practice for Chan masters because meditation and wisdom are simply twin aspects of the non expression of the Buddha nature. By comparison, in Yan Paskis translation, he aims to present a demystified image of Chan, which became the object of serious academic inquiry. This version has extremely detailed introduction on Chen in the 8th century of ancient China, which is more than 120 pages long. One of the Yampaski central narrative is that the Chen legend is a, is a pluralistic system which was grafted together over the centuries. Through synthesizing a number of historical documents, Yampaski examines the formation of different strings of Chen traditions. For instance, he cites a fourfold classification of Chan schools, which is mentioned in the inscription for Tiantai master Xuanlang. Put it simply, he argues that Huinong Chan was only one of these many different strains of Chan traditions, and it was certainly not the mainstream one. Besides, the opposition instead of the cross fertilization between Chan thoughts and indigenous Chinese culture traditions has been highlighted. For instance, he emphasized that Confucianists continue to complain and memorialize against this religion that was so contrary to the traditional, no political and moral concepts they upheld. 
Daoists, on the other hand, shown of their importance, resented the loss of power and respect of their beliefs. Contrary to Yampolsky's interpretation, Red Point's recent version aims to present a living context of Chen Zhen. Well, in the introduction, he does not explain what Chen is. He mentions that the Platinum Sutra was one of his favorite companions while he lived at a monastery in Taiwan in the mid 1970s. And that it was like meeting an old friend when he started translating it. It's also worthy of note that in a conversation on Zen Buddhism, uh, Red Points stresses that for him, Zen is a spiritual tradition that encourages its practitioners to free themselves from concepts. Another central thread of narrative is on the aestheticity and, and historicity of the Platinum Sutra. In the April of 1953, the journal Philosophy East and West published Hu Shi's article, Chan Buddhism in China, its history and method, and Suzuki's response paper, which probably marks the apex of their debate since 1949. Who argues that Suzuki's interpretation then ignores a historical approach and that Hui Nong's secret inheritance of the robe of the patriarchs was in all probability a myth of his student Shen Hui's invention. Drawing on the new materials from Dunhuang, who suspects that the genuine author of the Platinum Sutra um, was, uh, was actually the follower of Shen Hui school who had read the Shen Hui's works, padded them into Hui Neng's sermon and rewriting his life story into a fictionalized autobiography. Based on Hu's theory, there did, not, there did not exist Hui Neng Chan at all. Instead, it was a historical result brought out by a rebellion within Buddhism. In response to Hu's argument, Suzuki counters that then must be understood from the inside, not from the outside. Now one must first attain prajana intuition before proceeding to the study of its ob objectified expressions. Towards the theory advocated by Hu Shi, the three translators convey different attitudes. Wen T.C. Chen holds that Hu's theory is as bold as it is original. On the one hand, it's justified to say the work is a product of Shen Hui school since support can be found from 9th century Dong. Dunhuang manuscripts. On the other, there's no reason to doubt the authenticity of the sermon itself, since it was clearly recorded by Hui Nong's disciple Ba Hai, and the contradiction within the work was just a product of different times by different people. Comparatively, Red Point holds a similar attitude, yet in a more straightforward way. For him, Hu Shi is more of an iconoclast, and his claims is a brush and certainly controversial one. He further adds that most Buddhist scholars in China and Taiwan have rejected them as unlikely. Scholars such as Guo Peng and many others have examined the same evidence and have concluded that it was the student who was coaching the teacher and not the other way around. Contrary, Yampolsky holds a more sympathetic attitude towards Hu, arguing that all the documents contribute to the conviction that the Platinum Sutra was purely a product of Shen Hui's view. Rough statistics shows that the word legend appears more than 70 times throughout his introduction, which is probably one of the most frequent words and constitutes the great work of Yampolsky's narrative. Indeed, the importance and the validity of the platform social cannot be taken as a measure of its historicity. For instance, according to Micri, the famous words competition between Shen Xiu and Hui Neng simply never happened just because according to their biographies, the two men were not at their master's side at the same time. The work is certainly a mixture of facts and legends. However, it would also be unfair to discount the sutra as a product of pure imagination. For this issue, it suggests that a balanced approach should be adopted. On the one hand, uh, any phenomenon of Chen cannot be exempted from historical contextualization. On the other, the primary Chan works may not be created for historical intent, but born of the spirit of Chan with the aim to convening that spirit. In this regard, Morado calls for a due degree of distinction between factual history and literary history approach. As Morado suggests, one way of discerning the historical consciousness of Chan literature calls for readers to suspend judgment about their factual or fictional nature and to focus instead on the story themselves. Only in this way, one may achieve a more systematic and nuanced understanding of Chan history. 
Translator's notes also serve as a critical apparatus in the mediation text. In this study, the translator's notes constitute a large proportion uh, of translations. Due to the limits and of time, I will only give three examples here as a taster of their different approaches and strategies. In example one, Master tries to explain the many of names of different bodhisattvas. He says, compassion is the same as Avalokiteshvara, happiness in almsgiving is the same as Mahasdama, the ability to be pure is the same as Shakyamuni, and not to make differentiation but to be straightforward is the same as Maitreya. In translator's notes, Chan compares the triad of Avalokiteshvara, Mahasdama, Shakyamuni to three holy ones of the Pure Land. In addition, Avalokiteshvara is compared to the goddess of mercy in the West, and the Maitreya to the Amasya or the savior of the world. From this, we can see Chan adopts an intercultural approach with the aim to bring the Chinese Chan culture as pertinent and sympathetic to the English leadership as much as possible. As for Jan Paskis knows, he fully employs the rules of scientific pedagogy of his time. He refers to a substantial amount of literature, heavily advocating, annotating every possible detail of the work, such as the man reciting the Daoman Sutra to Hui Nong, or the sum of money left when Hui Nong took leave of his mother. In the example shown on the slide, Da Shi, great master, is translated as the first person pronoun I, which sounds definitely more modest. The justification for doing so is also given the translator's note, saying that the term Da Shi would never be used by Hui Neng, uh, who advocates non-attachments to any titles. Indeed, in the source text, there is a higher degree of power distance between Hui Neng and his students by positioning them in the hierarchy of great master and followers. However, in translation, this framework is repositioned as that of you and I. Through Yampaski's subtle framing, Hui Nong is not presented as a respectable master with miraculous powers, but a commoner, a teacher, as well as a Dhamma learner. From this note, it can be seen that Yampaski falls into the category of scholarly translators whose interest is scholarly. Besides, he tries to deviate from the established norm of hagiography as, uh, and presents the image of a demystified Chan master. Comparatively, Red Point focuses less on historical details or biographical facts, but presents Chan as a living tradition, which is more relevant to the process of transforming one's personal life from within. Red Point's notes are infused with his own life experiences. For instance, in section two, where it says when Hui Nong first paid homage to his master Hong Ren, there were more than 1,000 disciples at the temple. In response to the doubts on the size of congregation the temple, as a temple, the translator uses his own experience to prove that large population were a hallmark of monasteries in medieval China. The note goes as follows. In 2004, when I visited Yuchuan Temple near Shenxiu's former hermitage, the abbot showed me a Sui Dynasty rice cauldron that held enough rice for over 500 months. In a word, Red Point's personal experiences and reflections serve as vivid footnotes to the text, which could also provide nutritious food for thought. Apart from extra textual maneuvers, translators may also give secret interpretation of certain terms. For instance, in example six, when Tixin Chan rendered Maha Prajana Paramita Moho Buru Bulo Mifa into the law of the perfection of great wisdom, and he also translated formless precepts Wu Xiangjie into the displaying that phrase one from the attachment to differentiated characters. This translation is super long, right? Mm. Chang's treatment of the term is more of an exegetical paraphrase as named by Jin Natia. This implies that his translation is primarily intended for the general readership. Another intriguing point in Wen Tc Chang's translation is that both Bu Ti, Bu Ti, and Bozhe, Prajana, are rendered as wisdom. This is an intriguing fact since the verbal root of Bu Ti, boot, means to awaken. Therefore, the Enlightenment is a more standard translation in the Western world and through the 19th century translations of Max Muller. Actually, we can find some traces in the translator's notes, which indicate that Wen Tc Chen had referred to the Ding Fu Bao Dictionary of Buddhism. Based on this dictionary, Budi was initially translated as Tao in Chinese. Then in the great treatise on the perfection of wisdom, 
The term was annotated by Kumo Chiwa as Wu Shang Zhi Hui. One argues that in Chan's translation, perfect wisdom is very likely influenced by the explanation in this dictionary. To conclude, after analyzing both textual and extra textual models of thick translation, we could find Wen T.C. Chan's version emphasized the Chinese needs of the tradition through embedding it within Chinese culture tree art. Although this his interpretation is heavily influenced by Suzuki then, besides he adopts an intercultural and exegetic approach when translating the key Buddhist terms with a view to producing a more accessible image of Chan to Western readership. In Ian Paskis translation, a critical attitude is well convened in his lengthy introduction where the whole stories about early Chan are reconstructed under the narrative great work of legend. His masterly synthesizing of various documents also reveals the plurality and complexity of Chan traditions. Comparatively, Red Point seems not willing to negotiate the historical library rights through his vivid and inspiring commentary. Chan is presented as a living tradition, more concerned with one's inner spiritual pursuit. As my fun, final comment, I would also suggest that first, thick translation could provide a space where translators could signal their agenda as well as their ideological sympathy or antipathy towards the author text, thus guiding the way that Chan is presented and perceived. Second, the three ch thick translation discussed in this confined space of this study should also be put into the broad context of the transmission of Zen to the West in the 20th century. As Dunglin comments, Zen was seen as one of the most promising counterforce or antidotes to the one-sidedness of the West during the second half of the 20th century. Different from the two translations produced in the 1960s of America when Zen was conceived, conceived as a popular cult and a counter-culture alternative, the more recent words of Red Ping implies a transition in modern Chan Zen movement, which seeks a return to one's inner values and spiritual pursuits. This transformation has nothing to do with Westerners' curiosity about the exotic, but comes from a belatedly understood sense of their own needs and the longing for spiritual fulfillment. In this sense, be it Chen or Zen, the designation less matters, but what really matters is that it will continue to be a living tradition that is continuously open to new perspectives. That's all of my presentation. Thank you for your listening.